Turn our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8 and Psalm number 33. If you are uh, not aware, tonight is the Joyce Meyer sermon. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to read one of her sermons. That means we're going to take a look at the phenomenon that is Joyce Meyer. If you were here this morning, we had a wonderful time looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so uh, we're balanced. We, we, uh, we look at what's right, and then we rightly look at what's wrong, and we make sure that we know the difference between the two. Amen. Isaiah chapter 8 says this. Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 20. Isaiah eight twenty To the law and to the testimony... If they speak not according to this word, it is because God spoke to them. No, wait, I didn't, I didn't read that right. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because they have a special revelation. No, let's try it one more time, see if we can get it right. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Our concern is not how popular somebody is or how blessed they appear to be. Our concern is whether or not what they say matches what the Bible says. And if what I say or you say or Joyce says or anybody else says, for husband, what her husband says, if he gets a chance, what, if what, what anybody says doesn't match what the Bible says, that person's wrong and the Bible's right. That's just, that's just how it is. Is that your position? No, that's God's position. It was God's position before it ever became my position. God wasn't make, waiting for me to approve <laughs> of, of what he said. Uh, Psalm 33 says this. Psalm 33, verse number 4. For the word of the Lord is right. Psalm 33, 4. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. You say, well, what's, what's right? How do we know who's right? God's word is right. How do we know what's right? God's word is right. Well, if this person says one thing and that person says another thing, which one of them is right? They may not either one of them be right. The Word of the Lord is right. And so you take everything a person says and everything a person does and line it up next to the Word of God, and it doesn't match the Word of God, it's not right. Fair enough. That's, that's, that's pretty easy. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Timothy, I'm uh, sorry, First Corinthians 14 and First Timothy chapter number 2. Now, would you say that, just uh, based on your knowledge of the God, is the church a building or is it the gathering of believers? Gathering of believers, right? Not a building. So if believers gather in this building, church is met. If we gather in the front yard... Well, we're not having church. We're not in the building. No, the church is not the building. The church is the gathering. Church is the assembly. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 34. Let your... Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women keep... Help me out here. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to... But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their at. For it is a for to speak in the church. Now, do you know how we got to the place in America where women are preachers? You know how we got here? It's not equality. It's not enlightenment. It's not advanced revelation from God. It's not a better understanding of, of what works and what doesn't work. It's an absolute rejection of the Word of God. It's defiance and rebellion against the Holy God. And you can wrap it up any way you want to. You can try to sanctify it any way you want to. It's blatant sin against God. That's what it is. Well, God called me, not the God that wrote the Bible. Well, the Lord led me, not the Lord that wrote the Bible. He said, he said, when Christians gather for preaching and teaching, the women are to listen, not instruct, not preach, not teach, not... Now, now it's pretty plain. There's some things in the Bible that aren't all that clear. That's real clear. 
That's real good. So, well, well, I think, verse 30, 36, what? Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? The word of God didn't come from a woman preacher objecting to what the Bible says about women preachers. The word of God came to that woman and the Holy Bible, written by the Holy Spirit, preserved by a holy God, said to the church, let, let the women keep silence. I don't permit the idol. I, God, do not permit them to teach. I command them to be under obedience, uh, the, uh, obedience to my word. So before we read one word of one Joyce Meyer sermon, she's completely out of line according to the Word of God and the Holy Bible. And the fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of people in America defend her, all they're doing is testifying and saying, we couldn't care less what the Bible says. We like her. We couldn't care less what the Bible says. She makes us feel good. We couldn't care less what the Bible says. We can relate to her. So you're rebels who relate to a rebel. That's, that's your testimony. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't like this kind of preaching. Well, people who don't like the Bible don't like what the Bible says. That's... Uh, for you, don't act like I wrote it. First Timothy chapter two, First Timothy two verse eleven, or, or let's let's um, well, let's yeah, verse eleven be good. Let the women, let the woman, learn in silence with all subjection. Is there learning? You say, well, she's not a pastor; she's just a teacher. She's not supposed to be. If there's learning going on, she's supposed to be learning, not not instructing. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. He said, but what about, there's no but what about to it, man. Sheep follow goats, but man. there's no but to it. Now, now, you say, well, 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 James, surely, I mean, these, these people love the Lord. A lot of people love the Lord, don't know what they're doing. Right. A lot of people love the Lord just as wrong as they can be. Love, love's no substitute for right. Yeah. Right. Hi, hi. Sincerity is no substitute for truth. Don't you witness the lost people that say they love God, and they probably do. But you're not going to get to heaven without Jesus Christ. Yeah. And if you're saved, if you're not going uh, walk according to law and testimony, it's because there's no light in you. If you say one thing, God's Word says another, He's right and you're wrong. So the Bible says, now let's, let's, let's read it. Let, verse 11, let Joyce learn in silence with all subjection. But I, the Holy Spirit, I suffer not Joyce to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. You say, what do they do with that verse? They say it's for those times, for those days. It doesn't apply now. It's misunderstood. It's misinterpreted. Paul was a woman hater. Back in those times in that society, it wasn't acceptable for one. Anything but the truth. Right. Anything but obey the Bible. I mean, one lie is as good as another. Amen. One excuse is as good as another. Now, now the, here's, here's the answer. Said, well, the authority in the church is the pastor. He's the man. And if the pastor gives the woman the pulpit to speak, she's not usurping authority over the man. First of all, the pastor is not the authority in the church. The Bible's the authority of the church. And second, the Bible doesn't say she's not to teach unless given authority by the man. She's not to teach, comma, nor usurp authority over the man. It's two different statements. Two different statements. All right, Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. So let's see what kind of condition our country's in. Well, the woman president, woman vice president, woman Supreme Court justices, woman governors, woman mayors, women preachers. Hey, you're a woman hater. Love my mom, love my wife, love my daughter. Amen. I don't hate women. Amen. Just right's right and wrong's wrong. God wrote the Bible. God knew what he was doing. Amen. Amen. I just believe God and trust God more than I do this modern outfit. Amen. Modern bunch of rebels. Ed, I'm not going to trust them as, as far as I could walk on one leg in, in three minutes. That's right. Isaiah 3, verse 12. As for my people... Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. 
the Lord standeth up to plead and standeth up to judge the people. You know what God says? A country that's, that lets children run their homes and women run their churches and their societies is in a world of trouble. Amen. That's what God said. Now, nobody's saying Joyce, Joyce doesn't have the ability to preach. Nobody's saying she doesn't have the ability to attract the attention of a crowd and deliver a sermon. Deliver. Nobody's saying she lacks the ability. What we're saying is God has forbidden her to do what she's doing in the name of God. That's what it says. Now, he said, well, no, no, wait a minute. I mean, she, she, she's doing what she's doing for the Lord. Okay, now, now look, this is the mindset we've got to get over. Your emotions aren't more valid than God's Word. Well, I just think as long as you're doing it for God. Well, who says you're doing it for God? You or God? Now, no, wait. The Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? What if, what if I decided that for the next 365 days, I was going to commit adultery once a day for the next 365 days, but leave a gospel tract with the woman I committed adultery with. So I'm, I'm, I'm evangelizing. You said, no, that's right, you can't do that. That's wrong, it's a sin to commit adultery. But, but what if I'm witnessing? What if I'm leaving a gospel tract? You said, well, no, we can't do that. We can't do evil that good may come. The same God that said don't commit adultery said women can't preach and teach. Amen, right. Well, I think, see, that's the problem. Well, the way I see it, that's what we're up against. Our churches are full of people who think that what they think trumps what God said in the Bible. And we believe that what God said in the Bible is more important than what anybody or everybody thinks or feels, no matter how sincere they are, and that makes us cruel, narrow-minded hate mongers. You just hate everybody. I don't hate Joyce Meyer. I don't hate her husband. I don't like hate her kids. She got grandkids. I don't hate her grandkids. I don't have no hatred for her at all. But I sure despise what she's helping to do to our nation. Right. Everything our country does and skins the Word of God hurts every single person in our country, hurts every single one of our churches, hurts every single member of every single church. We need God's blessing. Amen. And you're not going to get a disobeying God. Amen. Well, uh, here's, here's the testimony. We'll go through the testimony real quick. Meyer said that um, she had her encounter with Christ at age nine in a Lutheran church. Not sure what that means. But at age nine, she had an encounter with Christ at a, in a Lutheran church. She uh, married a, uh, uh, a part-time car salesman shortly after her senior year in college, uh, or at a senior year in high school. Um, she and her husband per, uh, spent their time stealing payroll checks from their employer. They used the money to go on vacations in California. Uh, later, uh, Meyer and her husband uh, decided that they were in an emotional damaging, emotionally damaging relationship, and Meyer divorced her husband. She then spent several years bar hopping before meeting Dave Meyer, an engineering draftsman, and uh, they got married in uh, 1967. Meyer says that she was praying intensely while driving to work one morning in 1976 when she heard God call her name. She said, quote, I didn't have any knowledge. I didn't go to church. I had a lot of problems, and I needed somebody to kind of help me along. Okay, so this is a person who had an encounter with Christ, a thief, a bar hopper, divorced her husband, married another man, but one day while she's driving in her car, God called her name. Whatever that means. She didn't have any knowledge. She didn't go to church. She had a lot of problems. She needed somebody to kind of help her along. Quote, I think sometimes even people who want to serve God, if they have got so many problems that they don't think right, and they don't act right, and they don't behave right, they almost need somebody to take them by the hand and help lead them through the early years. She said she came home later that day from a beauty appointment 
full of liquid love. I was drunk with the Spirit of God, and that night at the local bowling alley I spoke in tongues. That's her testimony. <laughs> now, if I ask you for your testimony, I hope you could tell me something about trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope you could tell me something about being born again. I hope you could tell me something about... about uh, her testimony is, I got full of liquid love at a beauty shop and spoke in tongues in a bowling alley. That's the most popular preacher in America. Now, what does that say to you about the spiritual discernment of Americans? Not much. Not much. 1993, her uh, husband Dave suggested they start a television ministry, initially airing on Superstation WGN-TV in Chicago and BET. That's, uh, that's a racist outfit, Black Entertainment Television. Try starting white entertainment television, see how far that goes. But uh, her program is called Enjoying Everyday Life. Because God forbid anybody should think it has any connection to God or Jesus or the Bible or anything like that. Because you, you can't get a big audience with a name like the Gospel Hour. So you got to kind of, you know, enjoying everyday life at the bar hopping at the bowling alley with liquid love. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, uh, let's look at some, uh, some doctrine. These, these are excerpts from Meyer's books and sermons. What are we concerned about? Doctrine. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach? Do you line up with it? If you don't line up with it, we're not going to follow you. We're not going to listen to you. Um, Meyer, Meyer says, quote, this is from her sermon, The Word, the Name, and the Blood. Quote, you know something? I liked myself before I had started studying on this, because that's something God had just worked in me the last seven years. And I didn't start out liking myself. I didn't like myself at all. But I'm telling you, after I've studied the blood, I'm so excited about me that I hardly know what to do. How many of you study the blood of Jesus Christ and come out excited about you? Right, we right. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin in whom we have redemption through His blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Listen, every verse about the blood is a verse about how rotten and worthless and unworthy and good for nothing I am. You study the blood and come out liking yourself? What do you like about yourself? Well, I can't, if it wasn't for me, Jesus wouldn't have died. If it wasn't for me, Jesus wouldn't have had to shed His blood. I mean, I look at me. That's, a, that's an odd take. Quote, several years ago, I found myself completely worn out from trying to fight the devil. I learned many methods of spiritual warfare. However, they did not seem to be working. I had fallen into the trap that many Christians fall into. I had the right teaching, but the wrong order. Okay, now, doesn't that all sound good? I had the right teaching. I fell in a trap. I had the right teaching, but the wrong order. Now, she continues to say, I, I, had, I was feverishly applying the methods I had learned, rebuking and resisting evil spirits. I found these were empty formulas which wear us out and produce no results except maybe a sore throat, end of quote. You had the right teaching. Show me one verse in the Bible that tells you to rebuke an evil spirit. Show me one verse in the Bible that, that where, where you're told to resist an evil spirit. You had the right teaching from who? You got the right teaching from what? You're worn out from trying to obey right teaching, and then the example you cite of the right teaching you're obeying is nothing in any Bible anywhere on the face of the earth. Bunch of charismatic gobbledygook. Uh, look at me, I got spiritual power. I like myself. What do you think of that, devil? I've learned to like me. You better get out of here. Well, it's not working. I must have the order wrong. You don't have the order wrong. Your brain's wrong. It's the best. It's not Bible. Not anywhere in the Bible. Meyer's a word faith teacher. 
Now, if any of you don't know the word faith teacher, well, that's Kenneth Copeland, uh, Kenneth Hagin, all those guys. They, the, by faith, they believe that whatever words they say are God's words. That's the word faith movement. I, I, had, I, I imagined something, I felt something, I sensed something. It must be God because after all, I'm almost God. And so now I'm going to say it and, and, and I say it by faith and you believe it by faith and that's the word. No, this is the word right here. The Holy Bible is the word. Amen. Not something you cooked up. So anyway, Myers is one of those birds, and here's what she says about Christ's atonement. Okay, now, now just, just review. You might be a new Christian, or you might just be visiting tonight for the first and last time. But, <laughs> but let's, let's go over this. Jesus Christ is Almighty God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. He took upon Himself the form of man. He never stopped being God when He became man. He's not half God and half man. He's 100% God, 100% man, same time. He lived a perfect, sinless life, obedient to every jot and tittle of the law. Then He laid down His life on the cross as a sacrificial payment for the sins of the whole world. He cried on that cross, It is finished commended his spirit in the hands of his father, laid down his life, gave up the ghost. Three days, three nights later, rose from the dead, having the keys of hell and death, victorious, triumphant over principalities, powers, uh, said all power in heaven are given unto me. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. Now, of man, of man, the Bible says, we're not God, we're man. We're conceived in iniquity, we're born in sin. We're dead in trespasses and sins, and because we're sinners, we must be born again. Right? Jesus Christ, etern- life, He is eternal life. First John, John said, First John, He said, we've handled eternal life. We've touched eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. You and I, we're dead in trespass and sins because of our first birth. We need a second birth, a new birth. Okay? Now watch this. This is, this is Meyer. This is from uh, her book, The Most Important Decision You Will Ever Make. Quote, during that time, Jesus entered hell, where you and I deserve to go because of our sin. He paid the price there. No plan was too extreme. Jesus paid on the cross and in hell. God rose up from his throne and said to demon powers tormenting the sinless Son of God in hell, let him go. Then the resurrection power of Almighty God went through hell and filled Jesus. He was then resurrected from the dead and became the first born again man. You know who has to be born again? Sinners. You know who doesn't have to be born again? God. You know who Jesus was? He was God. That Bible says he bare our sin in his body on the tree. His soul, his soul, he's not, he's not a sinner. And that Bible says God the Father made his soul an offering for sin. If sin touched his soul, he couldn't have been an offering for sin. And you know what Joyce Meyer does not understand? The deity of Christ, the blood atonement of Christ, the sacrificial cross work of Christ, the finished atonement that Jesus Christ made at Calvary. He was not tormented in hell. He was not tortured in hell as a sinner. He didn't go to hell as a sinner, and he sure didn't get born again. What Jesus do? Look in the mirror and say, I say to thee, you must be born again. You know what that is? That's Copeland's nonsense that Jesus became fully God and you can become fully God if you'll get born again. That's the devil's lie in the garden. That born again Jesus thing, that's been, that's been floating around in charismatic circles for about 20 years now. It comes from Copeland, Hagen, Hinn, and Joyce Meyer. And it's a denial of the deity of Christ. So she, she wouldn't deny that. Then she doesn't understand it. She needs to shut her mouth and get in a Sunday school class. Amen. 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 Stop misleading people. 
You say, well, I've been watching her for years and I never heard her say that. You're never going to hear so much anything. Look, you live in a land where the Christians don't care about doctrine. If, if, her, if the people watching her had any concern about what the Bible says, they wouldn't be watching her. So it's not an issue or audience. Anyway, she goes on to say this, quote, There is no hope of anyone going to heaven unless they believe this truth I am presenting. You cannot go to heaven unless you believe with all your heart that Jesus took your place suffering in hell. You're a liar. Right. right. If you can say that to her face, I would too. Amen. Absolutely would. That's a lie. Amen. The gospel isn't believe that Jesus suffered in hell and thou shalt be saved. The gospel is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. That's the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. She, listen, that is, it, those are her words. That's a false gospel. Right. Galatians 1 said, If any preach unto you any other gospel that I preached unto you, let him be accursed. You say, I can't be Joyce Meyer. It says, let him be accursed. She wants to be a man. She'll have to take a man's punishment. There's a curse on people that say there's another way to get to heaven besides the Bible way. You don't have to believe something that isn't in the Bible to go to heaven. That's not in the Bible. Not one verse anywhere says Jesus suffered in hell. Not one verse anywhere says demons tortured him in hell. In fact, the word demons isn't in the Bible. Yeah. So she stands up there authoritatively, writes in a book authoritatively, unless you believe what I say that isn't in the Bible, that isn't taught in the Bible, that isn't written in the Bible, that isn't even subject suggested in the Bible, you can't go to heaven. Hey, Joyce, go home and cook supper. Well, read, right? Well, that's a mean thing to say. Really? I mean? How about somebody telling people the way to heaven is, is something other than the way to heaven? Man, don't, don't get mad at me. Get mad at her. Joyce Meyer teaches the classic board again. Jesus Gospel. Copeland Hagen teaches it. Fred Price teaches it. John Jacobs, Charles Capps, Benny Hinn, uh, Jan Crouch teaches it. Name a few. It's usually presented under the guise of revelation knowledge given by the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't say it. Well, I got, I got my revelation. Well, aren't you special? Now, look, look, come on. Let me give you, try to give you some perspective. And I'm not saying all these people hate the Lord. But when you hear somebody say, God spoke to me and he said, you know what they're saying? I'm so special that the rest of you got a Bible, but I got a special word direct from God. Nanny, nanny, boo boo. <laughs> Don't you wish you were as spiritual as me? Don't you wish you were as holy as me? Don't you wish you were as close to God as me? I wish I could float around in a dream world like you do. Probably be in a better mood. Okay, you ready? Genesis 1 1 through Revelation 22, that's what God spoke to you. Anything else is your imagination. If you, ha if you have a boatload of pride on top of your imagination, you say, God spoke to you. If you just have an imagination, you say, Well, here's what I thought. Now, if, you, if, if what you imagine God spoke to you, if we open the Bible and it matches what's in the Bible, that wasn't God speaking to you. That was the Holy Spirit calling to your mind something that he said to everybody. Let's see people that want something besides the Bible. They really go wow-wow for that stuff. Wow, Joyce Meyer, God speaks to her. God gives her special revelation. Who said? Well, she did. What's her authority for saying that? Well, well she's rich. She's got a big following. Well, then that would make the most authoritative voice on earth Satan. Because he's got all the kingdoms of the world and a gigantic following. Pretty poor reasoning. Uh, Joyce, uh, in her sermon, What Happened from the Cross to the Throne, uh, continues to uh, teach this stuff. 
Um, on that, uh, in that message, she says, at age 36, she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So obviously she doesn't know what she's talking about. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is what every saved person receives the moment they get saved. So if she did get saved at age nine, she got the baptism of the Holy Spirit then. If she never got saved, she never got in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you don't get the baptism of the Holy Spirit somewhere down the road. What she means is, now this is charismatic doublespeak. What she means is at age 36, I went... <laughs> And since, and since, I believe myself specially spiritual, I just figured that was God speaking through me in a heavenly language. There was something, if any one of you, if that happened to you, you'd say, God help me, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> That's what you do. You walk in for a job, you know, these people say, well, you know, I'm just filled with the Spirit, I'm filled with the Spirit. Really? How come you never speak in tongues at a job interview? How come you never speak in tongues at Thanksgiving dinner with all your unsaved family? How come you only do it when you're by yourself or when you have a bunch of other kooks that are going to fall for it? If you're filled with the Spirit, wouldn't you just be doing that all the time? I'm just, I'm just asking a question. My spiritual gift is teaching. I know my eyes don't roll back in my head and my, my head starts spinning around and teaching comes out. <laughs> and I don't just do it when I'm in environments where I think everybody's going to buy into it. Well, I've got the gift of tongues. Well, let's hear you. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Sure it does. My gift works that way. His gift works that way. Her gift works that way. Every other gift works that way. How come your gift doesn't work that way? Anyway, mm. Joyce said, 36, you see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sometime later, oh, here we go. She felt a flipping and turning in her stomach. Well, let, let's, let's look at the verses on that. Oh, wait, there's not any. I wonder if she was pregnant at the time. But she's got kids, maybe. Maybe. She felt a flipping and a turning in her stomach. This, she said, led to an understanding of her justification and a deeper revelation of Jesus' spirit death in hell. Oh, I get it. I'm justified. <laughs> you said, oh, wait, you're just making fun. How can you not make fun of that? Right. How do millions of people take that serious? Here they are. Man! Man! Sitting in an auditorium as Joyce struts about and says, I felt a flipping and a turning in my stomach and I understood the justification. Camera flips over to the man taking notes. Camera flips over to the otherwise intelligent businessman going, Who are these people? Look, the music was great. The special singing was great. The atmosphere was great. The light show was great. Her sense of humor was great. I'm not going to check anything she says by the Bible. I'm feeling good. So I felt a flipping and a turning in my stomach. Sound like a bad country song. This, she said, led to an understanding of her justification, a deeper revelation of Jesus' spirit, death, and hell. In hell, where he became sin and was tormented by demons. Look, that's just wrong. It's wrong on so many levels, we don't even have time to cover them all. It's just horribly, a, a horrific misunderstanding of the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't say the preaching of Jesus in hell is to them that perish foolishness. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. You never, no, you show me one time where anybody in the book of Acts went out and preached Jesus suffering in hell. 
preached he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. Why wouldn't they mention him suffering in hell if the cross and the resurrection took care of it? Meyer goes on to say, um, uh, uh, God yelled down through the universe, that's enough, let him loose. And then Jesus was able to rise. Meyer says, this understanding does not come from the Bible, it must come from our spirit man. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. Meyer also declared in, in, uh, in her uh, sermons, quote, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I didn't stop sinning until I finally got it through my thick head. I wasn't a sinner anymore. And the religious world thinks that's heresy. And they want to hang you for it. But the Bible says I'm righteous. And I can't be righteous and be a sinner at the same time. I was taught to say I'm a poor sinner. Well, I'm not poor and I'm not a sinner. That was a lie from the pit of hell. This is what I was, and if I still am, then Jesus died in vain. Amen. Okay, now that's, that's Joyce boldly proclaiming she hasn't the slightest idea what the Bible teaches about the old man, the new man, about standing in state, about flesh and spirit, about, about uh, how, how God views the saved individual and how the saved individual and others view that saved individual. She's absolutely, if she's saved, she's a total novice. She doesn't know enough about the Bible to teach our nursery class. So how does, how does somebody make a statement like that, have such a big following? Who in America wouldn't want to be told they're not sinners? Who in our churches wouldn't want to be told, no matter what you do, it's okay. God doesn't care. She, she's the perfect messenger for this generation. Sir. All right, uh, let's see what else we got here. Here's, uh, here's Meyer on Luke 23, 43, Jesus with a thief on the cross. Jesus said unto him, I say unto you today, you shall be in paradise with me. There's no punctuation in the original translations of the Bible. We have punctuated it, and in this particular scripture, it was punctuated wrong. They put in there, I say unto you, comma, today you shall be in paradise with me, making it appear that the minute Jesus died on the cross, he went straight to paradise. No, 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 he did not. The way it should read is, I say unto you today, comma, I'm telling you today, today I'm telling you, you're going to be in paradise with me, but you're not. You're going to be there today. I'm telling you this today, but I'm not going to be there today because Jesus had to go and suffer torment in hell that day. So the Bible says one thing, Joyce Meyer says another, and Joyce Meyer teaches her followers to believe she's right and the Bible's wrong. Now, in one sentence out of her own mouth, I will, uh, I will point out to you that she is maybe sincere, but stupid. Uh -huh. I say, uh, there, there's no punctuation in the original translations of the Bible. Question, Joyce. Are you talking about originals? or translations, there cannot be any such thing as the original translations of the Bible. Here's a good idea, Joyce. If you don't know what you're talking about, keep silent in the church. When you get home, ask your husband. He obviously doesn't know anything either. So, find somebody who knows at least a little something about how we got our Bible and ask them. Or just go on TV and talk like a fool and become a millionaire. You're mean, you're hateful. Call it what you want. When it comes to the name of Jesus, Meyer admits that she used the name for many years without results. This suggests, uh, she suggests we can learn how to use the name to obtain results. 
Christians pray in Jesus' name, we do. We have access to heaven through Jesus. But a police officer can speak in the name of the law, but he can't command what the law forbids. Okay? You can come to God in the name of Jesus Christ and lay claim to what Jesus Christ authorized you to lay claim to. You can't come to God in Jesus' name and say, I, 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 I want to be able to run 100 miles an hour. I claim it in Jesus' name. You don't use the name of Jesus. You use paper towels. You use knives and forks. You don't use the name of Jesus. He's not there for you to use. Meyer also teaches the same thing these charismatics teach, because she is charismatic, on Jesus' blood and how to use it. Um, Same way as you use Jesus' name. Consider these statements. One of the ways that we honor the blood is by singing about it, talking about it, studying about it, meditating on it. I know the devil is afraid of the blood. We must learn to use the blood. Here's an example of how you use the blood. Quote, My husband and I stay in various hotels because of our travels in ministry. Quite frequently, when unpacking and settling into a hotel room, I will plead the blood or put the blood on the room to cleanse or remove any wrong spirits that may be there from other guests. I do this by praying, by speaking the blood in my prayer. Now, you know what Bible verses that's based on? None. Right. You know where that's taught in the Bible? Nowhere. You know why charismatics say stuff like that? Because people who don't know anything about the Bible and don't care anything about the Bible think it sounds spiritual. I walked into the room and I pled the blood. What does that mean? Right. I spoke the blood. I walked in the room and I said, the blood. (laughs) <laughs> and when the bad spirits heard the blood, they all scurried down the drain holes and out the cracks in the, in the walls and, and dove under the carpets. Now, the way you know that's not true is they didn't leave her. <laughs> it's weird. I pled the blood and all the uh, bad spirits left. And I turned to my husband and I said, I can't speak in tongues anymore. Not that, but I've done that one. Now, you know something? This Bible's a big book. You know what's in Psalm 62? You know what's in Lamentations 4? You know what's in Numbers chapter 11? Well, if you don't yet know, and I'm not being critical, but if you don't yet know what's in the book God wrote, why are you making stuff up? Right, right. Well, I pled the blood over this, and I pled the blood over that, and I, I anointed the door with oil, and it, well, great. Why don't you do three cartwheels and hop twice in your left foot? I got an idea. Cross your fingers. <laughs> Where are rabbit's foot? Let's go look for four-leaf clovers. Oh, no, we plead the blood. It's what it's just one more fairy tale. Right. That's not in the Bible. If Satan and unclean spirits are afraid of the blood, what were the bulls of Bashan doing around the cross of Jesus Christ? Right. Where he shed his blood. Meyer goes on to say this. We laid hands on the check and prayed. I went and got all of our checkbooks and my pocketbook, and Dave got his wallet. And we laid hands on them and put the blood on them, asking God to protect our money, to cause it to multiply, and to see to it that Satan could not steal any of it from us. Too bad the people watching her didn't pray that way. (laughs) You need to start praying the blood over your children, your car, your home, your body. If you are sick in your body, plead the blood over your body. The life is in the blood. It can drive out the death of sickness. Okay, so just to review. One, she doesn't know what she's talking about. 
Two, she's just wrong as she can be. Three, her doctrine is just as, as fouled up as a Chinese fire drill at midnight. And four, she's got millions of people following her, buying her books, watching her videos, and sending her money. And those are the people that walk up to you when you're preaching the gospel and say, I just don't think you're doing it right. I don't think Jesus would have done it this way. Hey, may I, with a smile on my face, as politely as I know how, say, thank you for your input. Move along. Man, right? Because you obviously don't know what you're talking about. So all this pleading the blood stuff, and, you know, I, I you know, we, we put holy anointing oil on the piano so it wouldn't get out of tune, and we, you know, put holy anointing oil in the refrigerator so the bread wouldn't mold and all that. Just, you know, our country's just doomed. It's just, it's doomed. I mean, we're, people say, wow, you know, you think we're in trouble, you think God's going to, we're, look, we're so far past hope, you can't even see it anymore in a telescope. You can just look back at where there used to be a chance to turn this thing around. There's no chance anymore. You people used to criticize Billy Graham, and, and, and Billy had some. At least Billy Graham knew how to get to heaven. At least Billy Graham knew what Jesus did on the cross. This is this is this is our generation's Billy Graham, and she doesn't have a clue. Quote, this is Meyer, quote, the Bible can't even find any way to explain this, not really. That's why you've got to get it by revelation. There are no words to explain what I'm telling you. I've just got to trust God that he's putting it into your spirit like he put it into mine. She boldly with her lips says, I'm just making this up and you've got to believe it like I believe it. She boldly says with her lips, this is not in the Bible. But I believe God told me, and you got to believe it, because you got to believe God told me. Wow. Ignorance is bliss. Preparation for the ministry, Meyer claims divine call on her life, saying she sensed the Holy Spirit saying, you are going all over the place to teach my word. Well, why didn't she? She's going all over the place. And she's teaching, but she's not teaching his word. Um, what else we got? Okay, this is, this is some more of uh, Jesus getting born again. You ready? Meyer, quote, During the time that he entered hell, where you and I deserve to go because of our sin, he paid the price there. No pain, the plan was too extreme. Jesus paid on the cross and in hell. God rose up from his throne and said to demon powers, tormenting the sinless son of God, let him go. Then the resurrection power of Almighty God went through hell and filled Jesus. He was resurrected from the dead. Page 37. God's Spirit, capital S, left him. Page 41. The Father filled his Spirit, small s, again. For three days he was alone, paying for our sins as only a man. He went to hell to pay the debt you owed. You know what one of the earliest heresies was that the New Testament church had to fight? The idea that the deity came on Jesus Christ at his baptism, left Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, and, and he died and suffered as a man. He ceased to be God. Whatever that unclean spirit was that got that in the early church back in the first century, it taught Meyer the same thing. She says, God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, was, her words, her words, the Spirit God left him. He suffered only as a man. And then God, the, God, the Spirit of God came back to him and enabled him to rise from the dead. And so he was born again. It's, it's total blasphemy. It's complete heresy. It's a false. It's a false gospel. Amen. Joyce says, "Quote: This is from her book, Witchcraft and Related Spirits. No, a, a, an audio tape, Witchcraft and Related Spirits. Quote: Now, spirits don't have bodies, so we can't see them. Okay? There probably is. No, there is. I believe 
there is several angels up here this morning that are preaching with me. Right before I speak anointed statements to you, one of them bends over and says in my ear what I'm supposed to say to you. So what you're hearing are the words of angels. <laughs> yeah. You know who else believes that? About half the folks in the asylum. It's true. That fellow walking down the hallway of the of the mental institution and he held up his walking stick and the fellow said, What are you doing? He said, I'm Moses, I'm part in the Red Sea. Guy said, Who told you to? He said, God. Guy in the opposite room stuck his head out, said, I did not. <laughs> That's how that stuff goes. Look, look, here's, here's where we are. People, to people that people are so conceited, they're so stuck on themselves that they believe whatever pops into their mind is God talking to them and giving them special revelations that aren't in the Bible because they're so special. And if you say that with enough pride and enough self-confidence and enough self-assurance, people will worship and adore you as super spiritual. That's our generation. You couldn't have the Joyce Meyer phenomena without all this pride and self-righteousness. That's what it is. Well, anyway, we got to hurry. She believes in generational spirits. If your dad was a drunk, you have to be a drunk. You can't help it unless you learn how to properly plead the blood and all that. So anyway, all right, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I was, you know, I had every intent tonight of just keeping this as gen, genteel as, you know, gentlemanly. But if this stuff doesn't make you angry, You need to put your foot through the screen of that television, get back in your Bible. Or somebody, somebody's watering you down. This is, look, this is far more important than whatever Obama's doing. So why is that? Because bad government, bad president, bad schools, bad this, bad that have always had a counterbalance the righteous people who believed God. When a nation loses any counterbalance to the evil, when the churches and the Christians become as messed up as the world, there's nothing left. God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, if there's 50 righteous people there, will you spare it? And God said, yes. Those 50 righteous people were the balance for Sodom and Gomorrah. He got down, he said, if there's 10 righteous people there, were you spared? God said, yes. Those righteous people were the balance to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, America's wicked. We know that. Yes, our nation is corrupt. We know that. But when you look in the church... And you've got women preachers and women teachers and false doctrine and denial of the truth. What, on what basis can God spare this thing? This is, this is horrible. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now there's nothing wrong with being rich. Bible Bible doesn't say uh, that that uh, it's it's a snare or sin to be rich. It says if you will be rich. Okay, if the will, if your desire is to be rich, money becomes an idol. If you just end up rich, that's you know. Can't help that. You know, I saw this wall plaque for sale in some store somewhere. It said, God, give me a chance to prove money won't ruin me. <laughs> yes. 
Joyce Meyer says God has made her rich. She says everything she has came from him. Her $10 million corporate jet, her husband's $107,000 silver gray Mercedes, her $2 million home, her several other houses worth another $2 million, the $2 million houses each of her four children has bought with ministry money, all her blessings, she says, straight from the hand of God. Here I am, an ex-housewife from Fenton with a 12th grade education, she said. How could anybody look at this and see anything other than God? See, supposing that gain is godliness, what does the Bible say about the, supposing gain is godliness, from such, turn away. That's what the Bible says. Myers made herself into one of the nation's best-known, best-paid TV preachers. She has taken her prosperity through faith message to millions. She said, quote, if you stay in your faith, if you stay in your faith, you're going to get paid. I'm living now in my reward. Okay, enjoy it. You got it right now. You got it. Meyer's 16 grandmother runs the ministry of their husband Dave and the couple's four children. All the family, including the children's spouses, draw large paychecks from the ministry. Today are TV shows, regional conferences, fundraising website, bring an average of 8 to $12 million a month into her ministry. That's website sales. There's no, there's no reporting anywhere of what she takes up in the meetings that she speaks or the speaker's fees that she charges those that bring her into their city. Eight to $12 million every month in sales, sales. $12 million a month. Christians, so-called Christians, are spending to listen to somebody teach them who doesn't know what they're talking about. Isn't that sad? You've got people that believe the Word and love God and know how to win souls and know the true gospel, traveling up and down this country for years trying to raise enough money to scrape by on the mission field if they can get there. And this false teacher who's teaching in violation of the Word of God has taken in $10 million a month. It ain't right. The country's a mess. That's $10 million that isn't going to the churches those people are supposed to be attending. Uh, let's see, Meyer's hard-edged, self-effacing preaching has one or legions of followers. <laughs> it's an interesting word. <laughs> Many of them women who see her as part minister, part trusted friend. Really, call her when you're in the hospital. Get her, come visit you. Call, call, her, call her when grandma dies. Get her, come to, the, to hold your hand at the funeral home. She's not your friend. She don't even know you exist. Right. She's so down to earth, said bus driver Eva McLemore, 43, one of Myers Reef Conference in Atlanta. She makes you feel like she's your sister. She can totally relate to you, understands you with no condemnation and no judgment. That's it. She understands why I cheated on my husband. She understands why I, I did that. She understands, and she doesn't condemn me, and she doesn't judge me. She says, well, you're done stealing all that money down there at that courthouse. You be sure and clean the blood over it so Satan don't get it. And don't forget to send me your seed faith gift. I... Myers found the nice things, willing to spend for them. She has an eleven thousand dollar French clock, hundred five thousand dollar crown line boat docked behind her vacation home at Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, you can be a businessman here in St. Louis, and people think the more you have, the more wonderful it is. Myers said in an interview. But if you're a preacher, then all of a sudden it becomes a problem. Well, the Bible says, "Given it shall be given unto you." Ministry's headquarters, three-story jewel of red brick and emerald colored glass that from the outside has the look and feel of luxury resort hotel. Built in 2001 for $20 million. The building and grounds are postcard perfect from manicured flower beds and walkways to five-story lighted cross. The driveway, five-story lighted cross. Why not a five-story lighted hell? That's where Jesus paid for your sins. Yeah. 
Well, you had a cross up there for He didn't accomplish anything on the cross. Ah. You know how hard life is when you think? You know, you know how much easier it would be to just, just go through life with your brain turned off? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to uh, be confronted about all this stuff. Uh, in my driveway off complex line, both sides with flags, dozens of nations, large bronze sculpture of the earth sits atop an open Bible there in the parking lot. Uh, just outside the main entrance, a sculpture uh, of an American eagle landing on a tree branch stands near a man-made waterfall. Why a picture of an open Bible? Why not a, sta or a statue? Why not a statue of Joyce's imagination? She said, "Don't listen to the Bible. Listen to me." You know why you put a cross in a Bible there? Because it fools the suckers. That's that's why. That's why. A uh, message in gold letters greets employees and visitors over the front entryway. Look what the Lord has done. Jefferson County Assessor's Lifts uh, offers a glimpse of the value of some of the items. $19,000 pair of Dresden vases. Six French crystal vases bought for $18,500. $8,000 Dresden porcelain depicting the nativity. Two $5,800 curio cabinets. A $5,700 porcelain of the crucifixion. And a pair of German porcelain vases bought for $5,200. The decor includes a $30,000 round table. A $20,000 marble top closet. A $14,000 bookcase. A $7,000 Stations of the Cross porcelain, in case any Catholics drop by to visit. $6,300 eagle sculpture on a pedestal. Another eagle made of silver bought for $5,000. And numerous paintings bought for $1,000 to $4,000 each. Inside Myers' private office, a conference table and 18 chairs bought for $49,000. The offices are done with woodwork that cost the ministry $44,000. An assessor records the ministry, uh, the ministry's personal property at $5.7 million. She also owns a fleet of personal vehicles, estimated value $440,000. Meyer drives a Lexus sports car with a retractable top, valued at $63,000. Her son Dan drives the ministry's to, uh, Lexus sedan, value $46,000. Her husband drives a Mercedes-Benz AMG sedan. My husband just likes cars, Meyer says. Meyer's kept the, keep the ministry's uh, Canada Air CL600 Challenger jet, which Joyce says is worth $10 million at the Spirit of St. Louis uh, Airfield in Chesterfield. Ministry employs two full-time pilots to fly the Meyers around the world. Since 1999, the ministry spent at least $4 million on five homes for Meyer. It's also bought four homes for her children. Meyer's house is the largest of the five, 10,000 square foot Cape Cod style estate, uh, estate home, guest house and garage, independently heated and cooled, can hold up to eight cars. Three acre property has a large fountain gazebo, private putting green, pool and, well, I mean, you got to have that, pool and a pool house where the ministry recently added a $10,000 bathroom. The ministry pays for utilities, maintenance, and landscaping cost of all five homes. It also pays for renovations. Uh, let's see. I mean, what else you want to know? Uh, Myers brought a $500,000 atrium ranch in uh, Porto Sima, private uh, quarters club at Lake of the Ozarks. A few weeks later, they bought two watercrafts and jet skis and a crown line boat. Uh, Meyer says she doesn't have to defend how she spends the ministry's money. When the IRS has pressed her to ask what her personal income is, she said, are you ready? I don't take any more than I'm worth. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> I don't take any more than I'm worth. <laughs> All right, so that's Joyce Meyer. That's what she believes. That's how she lives. That's what the Bible says about what she believes and what she's up to. Now let me give you these little thoughts in closing. This is a note with regard to cooperation with parachurch or community-wide efforts. You know what the Lord did on day of Pentecost when He saved those 3,000 people? He put them in a church, and they, 
yeah, yeah, they got put in the body of Christ. Except for those of you who can't figure out yet when the body of Christ started. Um, but he put them in the body of Christ. And the Bible says every day they were together. Eating, breaking bread, fellowship, apostles' doctrine and prayer. So it was more than just being in the body of Christ. They fellowshiped together. And he gave that church pastors and teachers. And he said when he wrote, when he wrote to those churches where people assembled with pastors and teachers, he said, I want you to get your missionary money and your offering money together there. That's what he said. You know, when you send your money to somebody that's not in a church, not part of a church, not answerable to a church, not working in and through a church. You know what? You know what? What they're doing with that money? No, you don't, and you never will. Who's she answer to? Who's she accountable to? If she gets out of line doctrinally, who's gonna who's gonna correct her on it? If she gets out of line in her personal life, who's gonna help her with it? Nobody. It's not God's pattern. It's not what God set up. Um, supposing, supposing a community-wide effort is led by those whose sincere interest is the salvation of sinners, and supposing they want broad cooperation to ensure the maximum number of sinners will be present for the salvation message, here's what you got to keep in mind. Before we lock into a community thing or a, a radio station thing or a parachurch thing, just, just here's some stuff you got to keep in mind. God didn't give man a plan of salvation. He gave him a holy Bible. To throw out 99% of revealed truth in hopes of seeing a soul saved is not approved of God. Right. You know, it, listen, well, as long as somebody gets saved, that's all that matters. You're wrong. What matters is the Word of God. Every Word of God. So, well, I just think as long as somebody gets saved, so what are you going to do? You know, turn the youth activity at a rock concert? Well, as long as a kid gets saved, really? They like beer, you're going to serve beer? Well, as long as a kid gets saved. Well, they like drugs, you're going to have drugs? Well, as long as a kid gets saved. Well, they like to fornicate, you're going to, you're going to fornicate in the Sunday school rooms? Well, you know, as long as somebody gets saved, that's all that matters. You're wrong, man. Somebody getting saved is not all that matters. All of God's truth matters. Amen. Number two, God forbids doing evil that good may come. If the music, testimonies, doctrines, and tactics violate Scripture in hopes of appealing to the flesh of the lost so they can be saved, God doesn't approve. Third, believers are commanded not to be in yoke with infidels. If the effort includes those who hold false gospels, baptismal regeneration, conditional salvation, Jesus suffered for sins as a man in hell, to cooperate with such is not approved of God. Right. right. Number four, where will the converts be directed for growth and discipleship? If somebody did get saved watching Joyce... Where would they go to church? Where would she tell them to go to church? She wouldn't. She'd say, send me some more money for one of my books. That's not in the Bible. Paul didn't go to Philippi when he left town saying, now listen, don't, I mean, don't, don't, we're not going to start a church here. You just write to me and I'll send you one of my scrolls. He established a church in that town, put a pastor over that church, and put the people in that church. And then he went on and started another church. God. So, where would the converts go for growth and discipleship? If, the, if to the ministry or organization heading the effort, then they're just using the local churches to promote themselves. If they're told to take their pick among all the participating churches, and those churches are not sound doctrinally, that's not acceptable. If they're not set or placed in any local body, this is not in accord with scriptural teaching. So the bottom line is simple. 
Jesus started a church. He placed converts in a church, in a community with a pastor. They were to attend there, learn there, give there, evangelize from there. That's the New Testament. You won't find anything else in the New Testament. Beware of those who take people, work, time, and money from a church and contribute nothing to that church in return. Such activities have no sanction in the Word of God. You want to hear an interesting little, little principle? That you won't hear in any missions conference in America? In the book of Acts, you don't have one case of the home church sending money to the mission church. Every case you have, the mission church was sending money back to the home church. You say, well, that's that. I'm, I'm just, look, I'm just telling you. You can have a radio, Christian radio, that's siphoning from the church or that's part of a church. You can have a jail ministry that's siphoning from a church or part of a church. You can just go right online. But this woman and all those like her, She's taken people out of the church, money out of the church, power out of the church, accountability out of the church. There's no fellowship. There's no responsibility. There's no, it's, look, it's not scriptural. And you know me, I'm, I'm the least local church pastoral authority guy on earth. But all that money these people are mailing into her, what becomes of it? Nobody knows. What if it's not spent right? What are you going to do about it? What if she's crooked as a dog's hind leg? She answers to nobody. Hey, Peter's in a church and got out of line. Paul went in that church and Paul rebuked him. Peter got right and thing went on. How it's supposed to be. We're not saying everybody in church is right. We're not saying everything a church does is right. But if you do wrong in a church, you get corrected, you get help, you get straightened out, and you don't waste the rest of your life. You get out of fellowship and do wrong, you just keep doing wrong, justify it. So anyway, that's just a few little teachings and things there from the Bible. Now, do you, un do you, understand, do you understand why when you just try and do things the way the Bible says to do them, and you just try and go by what the Bible says. Do you understand why the Christians in your town oppose you? Because this is how little discernment they have. This is how little understanding they have of Bible truth. They, they, they wouldn't know it if it slapped them in the face. And you could walk right up to them, smile, tell a funny story, don't condemn, don't be judgmental, and lie right in their face and they'll open their wallet or pocketbook and make you rich. Is it any wonder they think you're fanatics? Well, we just press on. Try to do what God said, the way God said to do it. One day this money just might dry up in this country, and then we'll see, and we'll see. But in the meantime, press on regardless. Amen. And thank you, church. I appreciate what you do for me. Thank you for not giving me what I deserve. <laughs> I just get what I deserve. Wouldn't you hate, I'd hate the Lord to play that back? Next. Oh, it's Miss I Just Get What I Deserve. Uh, no. Been waiting for you. 